Mr. Van der Lanotte, you have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam President, honourable members of the Grand Chamber. The independence of the judiciary is guaranteed when there is no legitimate and reasonable doubt that the courts decide in an independent way. And this independence is supposed to exist. The applicant has to prove the contrary. That's the principle. The government states that the applicant raised this lack of independence of the Turkish courts in an abstract manner. We deny that, and we will prove it. We will do that by making eight statements, eight points, clearly showing the enormous pressure on judges deciding in the case of the applicant and the substantial impact of this pressure leading to the absence of the guarantee of irremovability and irrevocability. Due to logical time restraints, it will not be possible to illustrate each of these eight points with all the underlying cases. However, where needed to illustrate the point, I will give one be a typical example. <clears throat> I want to emphasize that none of the numerous examples that have been given and presented to the court in the different documents, until today, none has been contradicted by the government. First point, the negative role of the High Council of Judges and Prosecutors. The high, I will call, each time say the High Council, that's easier. Article 3 of the Decree Law, number 667, in contradiction to normal constitutional guarantees, stipulates that judges and prosecutors may be not only suspended, but also permanently discharged, dismissed by the High Court Council without any, without any adversarial process or investigation. The results of such dismissal is not only that the magistrate is dismissed, but also that he can never in his life directly or indirectly be employed in public service, even not as a lawyer. This is nothing but a social death penalty, and that without any contradictory procedure. This makes judges, notably the judges who has to decide in given cases, the judges who had to decide in the case of Mr. Yasinkaya, vulnerable. It is essential, I do not have to explain that to your court, that judges are not vulnerable when they do their duty. Due to this Article 3, they were vulnerable. Second point, this possibility is not a theoretical one. Since 15, 16 July 2016, until 22 July 2022, when the last dismissal, according to this procedure, was decided, the High Council dismissed 4,360 judges and prosecutors, 20% of the total magistrates plus minus. All courts deciding in the case of the applicant were affected. All judges deciding in the applicant's case were working in a court where colleagues of them suddenly were dismissed. We should value the impact of this. If you look at this court, and tomorrow 20% of the judges disappear, what is the impact on the other judges having to decide the day after in similar cases? So, for instance, two judges of the Court of Cassation were dismissed uh, in the Constitutional Court. 140 judges in the Court of Cassation were dismissed. Third, the High Council, as we said, it is nearly absolute powers without contradictory procedure, a dismissal. This High Council is an administrative institution. It's not a judiciary institution. The President of the High Council is the Minister of Justice, a political person, member of the government, presiding this council. 
The composition, logically, of the Council was severely criticized by the Venice Commission, by Niels Musnix, by the International Commission of Jurists. Fourth, it could be, have been a counterbalance, perhaps. In 2017, a possible appeal to the Council of State was installed against such dismissals. However, according to the communication of the Council of State itself, at the end of 2022, five years later, not one final decision has been taken. And the Council of State even had to apologize for the fact that 3% of the appeals, 3% were accepted in first instance, but immediately it added, it still has to be decided in second instance. This simply confirms, this four points, the untouchable position of the High Council in violation of the basic principles of the rule of law and the guarantee of irrevocability of judges and more specifically the judges who had to decide in this Yeltsinkaya case a person alleged to be a member of the Kulun movement was inexistent in legally and in practical. Fifth, the Turkish government public, publicly instructs magistrates to consider the judicial corruption investigations of 2013, it was confirmed today by the government, as a coup d'etat set up by the Gulen movement. Even if proceedings in the United States prove the accuracy of these 2013 investigations, such instructions still figure prominently on the internet nowadays. And the consequence, because we could say we don't have to take an account instructions, the consequence for not respecting such instructions are real and had an intimidating effect on the judges that had to deal with the case of Mr. Yasin Kaya. I will give to an example to show how important this uh, instructions and the not following instructions were, and it's a case that the court knows well. The judges, Mustafa Bashar and Metim Öcelik, released 62 police officers and one journalist accused, between brackets, of being a member of the Gulen movement. Immediately, President Erdogan and the High Council openly criticized the decision. May I pay your attention that the High Council criticized the content of a judicial decision. Result, the decisions were not executed. The judges were arrested. And the Venice Commissi immediately criticized, stating the facts described above clearly demonstrate that there are insufficient guarantees for the independence of the judiciary in Turkey. The case is well known. On 13 September 2022, your court came to the conclusion that in this case, Article 5, Paragraph 1 was violated. And may I pay your attention to the fact that the judgment in the Turkish, uh, this case in Turkey, was used in the case of Mr. Alsen Kaya, and today is put forward as a justification of the, con the conviction of Mr. Yalstin Kaya, a case, may I remember, where the court found the violation of Article 5, Paragraph 1. <laughs> to illustrate, sixth, the impact of this pressure, it has been noted in some cases that as soon as a judge is confronted with another judge taking a position even slightly favorable towards an accused who is considered to be part of the Gulen movement, completely unlawful and ununderstandable actions are taken. This is what happened, for instance, to Judge Beit, who in no way is linked to the Gulen movement. I want to confirm that. But this Judge Beit released four soldiers because he found that there was no evidence in the case file, which is his duty. Two days later, police officers and a prosecutor entered his courtroom, the sacrosaint of the judge, 
took him in custody. He spent three months in prison. Seventh, several judges questioning the validity of the bylock evidence were immediately dismissed or subjected to disciplinary or removed. A lot have been removed. This happened, for instance, in September, <coughs> excuse me, September 2016 to the three judges of the second Hatay Assis Court, who had critical questions on bylock, bylock and immediately were, were started a disciplinary procedure. If anyone, if your court would doubt about the link between the sanctions or the removals and the content of the decisions in several majority cases, most of all removals, sometimes disciplinary sanctions, were taken only against the judges who voted in favor of the accused, not the judges who followed the general line of the government. In such a case, not only the irrevocability, because they were not revoked, but also the irremovability, because they most of all were removed, was not guaranteed anymore to judges who had to decide, as the judges in the applicant case, about bylaw and the proof that this can be. Finally, eight point, the composition of the two main courts and the functioning of the two main courts that had to decide in the applicant's case. We know that the court of education was completely reorganized. We will not emphasize on that. However, in July 2016, 140 judges of the court of cassation were dismissed. In December 2017, some months before the Court of Cassation had to decide the case of the applicant, 100 new judges were designated by decree law. When the applicant case came before the 16th criminal chamber of the Court of Cassation, seven out of the 18 judges had been substituted by decree law. Moreover, the rules have been changed. The president of the chamber obtained completely arbitrary power to decide who would sit in the panel of five without rules, arbitrary. And at any moment in time, at any moment in time, so even when the deliberation started on the, in the applicant case, the president could remove judges and replace them by others even assuming that this did not happen in the applicant's case, the mere fact that it could have happened created an enormous pressure on these judges to comply with the government policies when deciding on the case of Mr. Yasin Kaya and the trust that the accused should have in this court, of course, was non-existent anymore. The composition of the Assis Court, who had to decide in the applicant's case also, was changed. It was seriously altered. In total, 173 of the second Assis Courts were removed without being asked by the judges. And a week later, this cleansed court we cannot call it otherwise, were designated to be exclusively competent for the Gulen cases. As was stated in the press, it had to guarantee the decision to be taken against the Gulenists. And especially in regards with the Kayseria Seas Court, which intervened in the case of the applicant, the High Council appointed a new chairman, removed a judge without his request, and appointed a new just in, a, a judge instead. The government claims that the applicant puts forward abstract, abstract claims. In my opinion, there is nothing abstract in this missing 4,360 judges. In my opinion, there is nothing abstract 
in sanctioning these persons to a social death penalty. In my opinion, there's nothing abstract when judges are arrested in their courtroom because of doing their duty. There is nothing abstract in removing judges for the same reason to another place thousands kilometers away, and each time judges who have to decide in a similar case as in the case of Mr. Yeltsin Kaya. All these facts are structural. They are concrete. They were a threatening reality in the daily life of the judges who had to decide on Mr. Yeltsin Kaya. They affect in a worrying way the independence, the possibility to decide in an independence way. And how could an objective observer, not talking about the accused, how could an observer not come to the conclusion that there is a legit, legitimate doubt about the independence of the courts and the judges having judged the case of the applicant. Shortly about Article 11, we have different positions from the government. We saw that they sometimes say, yes, but Article uh, uh, the, the, the adherence to the to the associations and to the union has not been decisive. It was only something, I quote uh, the summary, a factual circumstance that supported the conclusion that's in the last uh, summary of uh, the government. I only will cite what the judgment say when, when the court has to decide if the applicant if effectively was part of the hierarchical structure of the terrorist organization, the court states, on the ground that he was a member of multiple associations and trade unions, unions and that he used the pilot application. The fact he was member of this union and member of this association has been taken in count as a substantial reason for the conviction and is, I cannot say it otherwise, a violation of Article 11. As far as Article 7 is concerned, the applicant reiterates that the decision of the Court of Cassation on 24 December 2008 is very important to assess the, the situation of the applicant. In 2008, the court decided that the Gulen movement was not a terrorist organization, and the applicant could rely on that. That was the only decision that was known. To be honest, it's not because the government of the corruption cases in 2013 says that this is a kind of a terrorist act, that it is. The only official institution that called the Gulen movement a terrorist organization was the National Security Council, and that was in June 2016, not before. Before, we had the parallel state sometimes called by the government, but that doesn't show anything. Everything can, everyone can say for a political opponent that he's a parallel state, but the term Terrorist organization is the first time in June 2016 in the National Security Council. May I remember that all the facts where the applicant is accused for are prior to that period. Only his membership of the union was a bit longer, and we can state in June it is said that it is a terrorist organization in July. Two weeks later, he stops his membership of these associations, as is in the document. Where their convictions that there were, uh, in his conviction were judgment were referred to, yes, judgment posterior to the facts. So, the mental element, the basic element of each crime, that the applicant knowingly and willingly was member of a terrorist organization clearly is not present and has not really been examined. Although your court is not a fourth instance court, we do not need to be remembered on that. The court, however, cannot deny that the alleged but denied conversations on Bayrock, so important, in no way, no way or related to anything that has to do with terrorism. Nothing, not one word. Taking into account these elements, we cannot conclude otherwise than that Article 7 in this case has been violated. Thank you.
Thank you for your submissions.